Welcome to the Muscle Expert Podcast with Ben Pakulski, one of the world's top professional bodybuilders, an expert on human performance and mindset mastery. Ben dives deep to deliver the strategies of the top experts to upgrade your body, mind, muscle, strength, performance, biochemistry, and how to become the upgraded modern man. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Muscle Expert Podcast. I am your host, Ben Pakulski, and today we're gonna do the injury deep dive. So at some point in your training career, you've either experienced an injury or you're going to experience an injury, or it's gonna be chronic and overuse, or it's gonna be something that's acute and pretty traumatic. At some point, you're gonna seek rehabilitation, whether it be from a chiropractor, a physical therapist, massage, active release, muscle activations, any number of uh, different modalities can help move the needle toward bringing you back to optimal health. But which one seems to be an extremely confusing issue and topic for most people? Um, today's guest, Dr. Bo Hightower, is an integrative therapist, and he's the guy behind the scenes at the UFC events helping these top athletes be their best, not only in their training, but at the event as well. So today we're going to discuss the integral approach to rehab. So Dr. Bo Hightower is someone who seems to be one of the top in the world when it comes to understanding, you know, which modality is going to work for you based on the manifestations of your particular injury. So today we discuss, we discuss assessing contractile ability through a range of motion. You guys know I talk about this all the time on the muscle intelligence community, uh, the first and most important thing you guys need to understand to prevent injuries is what is my active range of motion? What can I actively control with my muscles? And if you go outside of there, that's when injuries start to happen, whether it be acute or chronic, things are going to happen. So start paying attention to that. And Dr. T Hightower talks about how to begin to assess that and then how, how to begin to make it better and work in your favor. We also talk about finding the right treatment for your goal. Is it chiropractic? Is it muscle activation? You guys know I've become maybe the world's biggest advocate for muscle activation techniques because it works. But Dr. Bo Hightower, some really unique insights on what works well for what injuries. Um, he also talks about why he avoids soft tissue treatment com coming into a fight for the UFC fighters. And, and maybe if you're training really, really hard a certain day, what you should back off on treatment wise. Like, is it a good idea to get a massage before training? Is it a good idea to get a massage or any type of treatment for 48 hours before training? These are very important questions you should be asking yourself because sometimes they actually may be contributing to the likelihood and predisposition for injuries that most people don't think about. And he gives us some really unique insights into as to why. He also gives us his thought process behind diagnosing an injury. So to know how to treat it, you gotta know what it is. Uh, you know, is it soft tissue? Is it connective tissue? Is it uh, some adhesions or is it a muscle tear? And uh, is it just some pathology from poor posture or poor muscular alignment or muscular imbalances? And all these things are kind of the abyss of injuries, right? So most people go, oh, this muscle is really tight, therefore I should massage it. And that's not necessarily the smartest approach because if a muscle is tight, from my experience and my belief and my understanding, uh, muscle is tight for a reason, and your brain is tightening it up. Your nervous system has sensed an instability. Your nervous system has sensed something that says, hey, tighten that muscle up to protect me. And going in there and jamming an elbow or a lacrosse ball in there may not be the brightest idea for you, especially if your objective is staying healthy long term. If your objective is loosening up to feel good, that may be something altogether different. But if your objective is, hey, I want to be able to perform at my best, well, now maybe there's a different thought process on how you're going to optimize how your body works. Um, are UFC fighters doing strength training and what type of strength training they're doing and how are they integrating all the multiple modalities? Like super interesting to think about. These guys are fighting two, three, four hours a day. They're doing cardio. They're doing weight training. How do you integrate all these things? These guys are probably the most overtrained group on the planet. And overtraining, as we know, often is going to lead to overuse injuries. And how is Dr. Bo Hightower actually mitigating these things? And this is a strong reality for a lot of us, right? If we're trying to push the needle in any sport, no matter what it is, if, it, if it's fighting, if it's endurance, if it's bodybuilding, at some point something's going to break. Um, so learning how to kind of balance and all these and juggle all these plates is a very, very important part of our conversation. So I really hope you enjoy our conversation today. And as always, I appreciate you guys. If you love the show, share it with somebody you love. Enjoy the episode with Dr. Bo Hightower. 
All right, Bo. So we've got a uh, massive demographic who are really pushing the envelope, really pushing themselves on a lot of different ends, uh, you know, working really, really hard in the gym, hashtag killing it every day and uh, developing a lot of imbalances, a lot of um, aches and pains and bumps and bruises due to just this chronic overuse. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of stuff you've done online and you're doing a great job with balancing out pro athletes and fighters um, and really allowing them to, um, you know, use their body to the best of its ability. What are some of your strategies that you lean toward to start mitigating these overuse injuries and imbalances? Right. So what we have to look at is there's several components that go into joint motion and force production as well. So in order to generate the appropriate force, we need to make sure that that muscle has the ability to contract through its normal range of motion. So if yeah. the muscle is too short, it's also going to be weak. If it's too long, it's going to be weak. Also, if the biomechanics of the joint itself are inappropriate, you're going to have some problems as well. So like here's a, here's a prime example of developing balance within our body. So we know that the deltoid is going to combine flexion, uh, abduction, and extension. The combination of those movements is overhead movement. So if you're doing a shoulder press or military press, that is the combination of those three movements. Yep. Well, the muscle that brings the arm down, like for a lat pull, is the latissimus dorsi, which is a much stronger, bigger, uh, more advantageous leverage-wise muscle than the deltoid. So over time, if that lat becomes tight from us not raising our arm far enough or from overuse or even poor mechanics of the humerus, what's going to happen is that it's going to hold the humerus downward. So instead of getting a nice force couple, meaning a smooth rotation, so a joint should move around its axis very smoothly. Mm -hmm. And what can happen if that lat is pulling that humerus down, when you go to engage your deltoid and your supraspinatus, it's not going to spin around a center. What it'll do is move offline. It'll move, it'll move the humerus head up into the socket itself and cause impingement. And then we can start to get an orthopedic consequence. It'll start to rub against the acromion. It'll wear out your rotator cuff and it'll cause bony impingement. So we end up with these long-term consequences of orthopedic damage just because we had an imbalance to start with. Aside from that, you know, your, your deltoid growth is going to be a lot better if you get better muscle activation. If you're not having to fight that lat, both from the, the tension and the, the advantage of having gravity on the side. Man, that's beautiful. And that, you know, that's speaking to the choir, right? It's That's exactly what I'm talking about is training these things to their entire uh, length of range of motion. And so what are the, some of the strategies you start implementing? Like, is it just a matter of taking a muscle through its full range of motion at, at all ports in the range and actually challenging it? Or, what, you know, what, how do you start, um, you know, everyone on this podcast is like, hey, man, I got this injury, I got that injury. Sure. It's always, you know, some dysfunction at a joint, some dysfunction at a tendon or manifesting at the tendon. Um, what are some of the strategies you like to implement to actually start overcoming this? And obviously it's hard to make a broad stroke statement, but do you have some things that people could start doing to start uh, one paying attention to um, changing it? Right. So there's, there's a few things we can kind of approach when we look at that. So there's a lot of debate right now talking about, you know, the efficacy of what self myofascial work does, what stretching does, what warming up does. Um, and, and when you look at science in the exercise science realm, there's a lot of variability to it. It's very hard to study these kind of things because of different types of cohort studies. There's just not a lot of money funding it. So we're going to use our logic to kind of work our way from acknowledging the research, but not letting that dictate everything that we do. And we're going to use a little bit of anecdote in accompanying that. So what do we generally know? Well, we generally know that static stretching before working out isn't the best idea. The tissue is somewhat viscous. It becomes more brittle. That's probably not where we're going to start. So say I'm doing a shoulder day, right? Well, my big internal rotators that are going to be the pectoralis major, the pec minor is going to kind of pull it forward a little bit too, and then you're going to have your lat. So if I'm already imbalanced, which most of us that do a lot of chest work and we're doing computer work are, one would surmise that we're all going to be in a preloaded position. So one of the best ways to approach that is to get those muscles to loosen up first. That way you can um, get those muscles to engage from the right position. So one of the best things that I found, say, we'll just take shoulders still since we're on that example, is to roll out my lats, roll out, and you've got to figure out which muscles are accompanying too. So the long head of the tricep is an extensor of the shoulder too. So I always make sure I hit my long head of the tricep, and I'm just going to use a dip bar in my case. I'm going to lean on there. I'm going to kind of press into the sore spots on the lat for about 30 seconds. That's kind of what we think uh, it takes to neurologically deactivate that a little bit, get the pec major to relax a little bit more. Then what I'm going to do is go through my dynamic warm-up, uh, work through light weights, uh, maybe a little bit of a muscle energy stretching. Once I do that, now I have less tension, tensile tension on those muscles, and I can activate them through a greater range of motion. Um, Here's another one. So most of us end up protracting a lot. So not a lot of people do self-myofascial work on their serratus anterior or their subscap. But think about this. Can't imagine why. Yeah, I know, right? Because <laughs> it sucks, right? <laughs> terrible. It's terrible. But it's really effective too because here's the thing. If we're already protracted, how do you retract to generate enough force to do protraction? 
So your bench is going to suffer greatly if your serratus anterior is, is overactive. And if you bench a lot, there's a good chance that it is shortened because that's what happens when you break tissue down and it reheals. It, it, it gets shorter. Yep. So you can kind of reach up with your fingertips right under the pec, kind of massage in there for about 30 seconds. Um, and we'll even do tests like that and see what your bench feels like afterwards. You should feel a lot stronger. You should feel like your chest actually engages from a better range of motion. So just kind of down like the pec line, the lateral pec, um, you know, massaging right under almost where the pec minor is. Yeah. So I'll have somebody put their arm over their head. So they just reach yep. up, put their hand on the head like that, reach underneath there, and you're going to kind of feel right along the ribs. And when you find those little sore spots, just take your fingertips and just cross friction there, about 30 seconds or so. Find those little sore spots, work on them. Um, we've also done some stuff with some of our power lifters and, and some of our pro bodybuilders too. Um, you know, I've had the the luck of working with some guys like Flex Wheeler, uh, Jojo Netaforo, um, big time power lifters too, Ed Cohn, a few of them. Um, and what we do is we'll have them take a tennis ball, cut the end of it, add it onto a little skinny piece of PVC pipe, they stick it in the corner, and a lot of these guys don't have the range of motion because they're so bulky to reach their own armpit. Yeah. <laughs> so they can kind of get that soft end of the tennis ball I and massage them. No what you're there. talking about, man. I've yeah, never right? been there before in my life. He knows exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. So then you hurt yourself trying to fix yourself, right? So, um, yeah, those are some really good strategies. And, like, when you're looking at the glutes, like and, – and what I'm going to point out here just because we have, like, a limited amount of time is some of those muscles people don't think about working. Like I said, the upper part of the lat. There's a muscle around the hip called the quadratus femoris. Um, a lot of people will think they're having hamstring tightness and they're not turning at their hip. And so the muscle basically attaches from the ischial tuberosity to the greater trochanter. It's a really short muscle. Um, you can usually get a little cross ball and just kind of hold that spot down. But when it's holding in external rotation, because synergistically it works when you're squatting, when you're lunging to get your glute max and your glute med to engage too, but people can stretch their glute max and their piriformis. It's, it's almost impossible to stretch the quadratus femoris because of the rotational angle. But if they can get that to clear, all of a sudden they get better hamstring activation better hip mobility, better depth to their squat. You know, when we start to look at the kinematic chain and the biomechanics, that's what we're looking for is we're trying to get optimal range of motion. That way, A, we're getting good muscle activation, and B, we're not forcing ranges of motion, which end up injuring us in the long run. Hey, I interrupt this podcast to bring you a time-sensitive message. If you guys have ever considered using mushrooms, and I talk about lion's mane, I talk about reishi, I talk about cordyceps, I talk about turkey tail, all these things that I often bring you guys messages about from Four Sigmatic, now's the time to act. So right now, Four Sigmatic is liquidating some of their products. So they're retiring some of their original recipes. They're retiring their cacao with cordyceps, which by the way, tastes absolutely amazing. Uh, coffee with cordyceps, reishi elixir, cordyceps elixir, and Lion's Mane Elixir, which you guys know is the one I've been using for the last year, they're liquidating it. And the, the prices are absolutely ridiculous. So they're 30 to 50% off what they would normally be. And because you are a listener of the Muscle Expert Podcast, if you do it right now, you get an extra 10% off of that. The prices are absolutely ridiculous. But here's the catch. It's only today and tomorrow. So if you unfortunately listen to this, listen to this podcast late, you're going to lose. So those dates being July 19th and July 20th, 2018, um, you're going to get 30 to 50% off just for going. And because if you use the code MUSCLE, you get an extra 10% off, which honestly brings the prices so ridiculously low. You guys are going to get over there now before they get out of stock. So if you want this link, you want to go to the show notes and check it out. You can also check uh, it out at foursigmatic.com slash muscle. And again, the code is muscle. Head over there now. And as always, enjoy the rest of the episode. So, you know, kind of pulling back a little bit here, some of the things you brought up, I really want, I don't want to gloss over these things. So you talked a little bit about um, the current research around um, the efficacy of soft tissue, stretching, myofascial release, and even foam rolling. I want to dive into those, man, because I want to know your opinion. I want to know your um, almost some of the facts that you know and, and uh, what you think is a little subjective because, you know, I, I've obviously been an athlete for a long time, had the amazing opportunity to work with hundreds of therapists around the world, have some that are really, really good, and I've had some that are really, really bad. Um, and, you know, some of these modalities I feel work really, really well, and others I'm like, man, that didn't do anything for me except make me worse. But obviously mm -hmm. I'm, I'm N equals one, you know. Um, I'd love to hear your um, opinion, I guess, on um, the – uh, implications and the uh, usefulness of soft tissue and, and maybe where it, soft tissue work and maybe where it isn't useful that people are trying to sure. fit a square peg in a round hole. So before I jump into that, let me get your uh, experience and opinion on what's worked for you and what hasn't uh, generally. Well, I guess it depends what my objective is, right? So um, for me, 
I think foam rolling is, is given uh, too much uh, weight, meaning people think, hey, man, if you got a problem, foam roll it. And I think that general broad stroke statement is ignorant. Uh, I think foam rolling has a place for some people. Um, but on, on mass, you know, everyone in CrossFit just goes, oh, man, just prepare for exercise by foam rolling. And I'm like, right, well, that, that's not, you know, that's not useful. Uh, I think stretching is, um, as you know, um, misunderstood. People think it's the, the objective of stretching is to uh, increase range of motion, which maybe it is. But I think maybe it's more of a it should be looked at as more of a tool to relax and um you know, maybe increase the passive range of motion while acknowledging that it's doing nothing for increasing the active range of motion. Mm -hmm. um, soft tissue work, I've had a lot of ART done. I've had a lot of rolfing. I've had a lot of uh, Graston. I've had a lot of everything, really. Uh, I think they're great. Um, but I also acknowledge the implications for me uh, in turning muscles off. So if I go and do a massage and I expect my muscles to neurologically be uh, down-regulated, and as you acknowledged, you know, you're going you're gonna to be um, turning off, though, or, or at least... Um, turning down the tension in those muscles, which, you know, subjectively maybe is great short term, but is that contributing to my long term, uh, long term objective? Um, for me, the greatest benefit that I've, re I've received from um, all modalities is a combination of soft tissue work with muscle activation techniques. Um, so if I have something that turns the muscle off, you know, the soft tissue techniques that are really digging into something, um, you know, down, definitively in my eyes, down regulating the muscle's ability to contract on purpose, like loosening up the, the muscle tone and then finding what, what you know, corresponds to that, that needs to be activated uh, and turning those muscles on has been tremendously effective for me. And the benefit I've seen is, is not just like, you know, a day or two. It's like, uh, you know, you get a month and you, you can go and literally go with the intent of trying to break it. And, and I wasn't able to break it, you know, which is pretty awesome. So that combination mm -hmm. has been very successful for me. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, one of the issues that we run into in medicine, healthcare, and, you know, coaching, all these kind of things is, is finding the right application for the right patient. Yeah. So we know that, that we, we kind of know what most modalities do. And I get into this even because so, so if you guys don't know my background, I'm a doctor of napropathy too, uh, board certified as an exercise physiologist. I'm also a doctor of chiropractic. So there's some lenses that I'm looking through um, with some amount of bias as well. Um, but one of the issues that you run into with these modalities is applying Absolutely. the wrong treatment to the wrong patient population. Um, and that goes with the research too. The research does a kind of a poor job of that as well. Um, so when we're talking about, like you said, which intervention, where, when, and why, that's the most important aspect of it. Like, uh, here's a good analogy. Analogies are sometimes useless, sometimes not. But you wouldn't brush your teeth for 10 mm -hmm. minutes and expect good outcomes from that. So we, we kind of have an idea of where self-myofascial release works and where it doesn't work. And then different modalities of why or why it doesn't as well. So we think that there's a, you know, based on the, the literature that we have, we, we can say for now, because the literature changes, that foam rolling does seem to delay DOMS. It does seem to, to increase temporarily at least. Um, the elasticity of the muscle group, whether that's through warming up or neurological deactivation, we don't 100% know. Um, we think it's probably neurological deactivation. And one of the ways that I kind of explain that to people is it kind of works the opposite way of a, of a deep tendon reflex. So if I hit you on the knee, your knee should extend. And the reason why, at least biologically speaking, is I've tricked your body into thinking the quadricep muscle is longer than it should be. So you have a deep tendon reflex that's going to try to correct that. And so what happens is it shortens. The same thing happens if you miss a step outside. Instead of falling and cracking your skull open, you have an evolutionary adaptation to get your muscles to jolt to try to protect you. You don't have a choice. It's a reflex. It's not mm -hmm. a cognitive thing. It happens at the spinal level. And we think that may, maybe what, what's happening when we hold trigger points, quote unquote, down, you know, founded by Dr. Tra Janet Travell, is that you're kind of tricking the neurological system into thinking that muscle's shorter than it should be. So neurogenically, your body's going to try to elongate it through the center, through the sarcomere, through the belly of the muscle. Um, that's a little different than rolling, and that's also a little different than cross friction. That's different than dry needling. So they all deactivate the neurological system, but kind of through different means. Um, we can say with a decent amount of certainty that what happens when we're static stretching is we are elongating the tissue. What does that do? Well, the research shows that stretching does improve range of motion, at least um, in the short term. Um, is that beneficial? Well, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. And in fact, a lot of times it's, it's not. Um, if you've ever seen, if you've ever been in a clinical practice, you see the types of injuries that come in from yoga, particularly hot yoga. Um, we see a lot of hip replacements that are needed. We see a lot of torn hamstrings. So there is a 
functional range that we need to get to as far as range of motion where you don't want to be too loose because that is also making you susceptible uh, to joint hypermobility, poor muscle activation. And I would argue that actually too much joint motion is going to predispose you to arthritis more than too little uh, joint motion. I completely agree with you on that. And, and you see um, that all the time is you get these people who just look like – you know, uh, overcooked spaghetti, right? And, and they have no muscle tone. And, and that's, it's important, man. Like all these people who I've been doing yoga a lot lately and I'm, I'm just observant and these people who just need to add some muscle tone. And that's obviously going to contribute to these pathologies as well. So I completely right. get it. You know, there's extremes on both ends. Yeah. So there's, there's a balance you need to find, right? So, and, and if you look at like a, a, a traditional, um, even a Rolfing analysis where we have tight muscles, weak muscles. You know, generally we can say most people have tight rectus abdominis, tight hamstrings, tight calves. There's even some neuro neurological basis for this. Like we're wired for flexion. If you look at a baby, its primary wiring is for flexion. The first thing it does is it brings its hand to its mouth to eat. Um, when its neocortex or its frontal brain is turned off, what do we go into? We go into a fetal position. When we see somebody with a, a hemorrhagic stroke on one hemisphere, the other side of their body moves up into a spastic flex position. So we, we definitely need to work on strengthening our extensors, generally speaking, to allow us to stand up straight, to get better activation back to the cortex. And we have some generalities that we work through. But again, people don't work in generalities necessarily. If you look at a Gaussian distribution, a normal curve, right, we have standard deviations. So everybody falls along the normal curve. The vast majority will call them the normal people fall in that first 70 percentile. But we do have outliers on both ends. So we have people with EDS or Lodansler syndrome where they, their connective tissue actually doesn't work. These people's bones actually do move out of place. Their cranial bones actually do move. Um, their vertebrae actually do move, which is actually a bad thing. You know, they do respond to manipulation, very specific manipulation. But you can't take that example and apply it to the whole because the vast majority of people's pelvises are fused. Most of the vast majority of people's uh, craniums are fused. And I think that's where some of the alternative medicine gets things wrong is they see an anecdote and they apply that to the whole. Now, I think there's also a problem in worshiping the literature, too, particularly in exercise science, because what we've lost is evidence based medicine, which is a triad, meaning that there's a three point component. If you look at a Venn diagram of patient input, acknowledge of the literature, clinical expertise. So it's easy to read an abstract, but what does that actually mean? Well, when you apply that with some expertise, which you're going to get from bodybuilders, which you're going to get from people that have actually lived real life experiences through trial and error on themselves, then we can start to arrive at something more reminiscent of the truth. So uh, foam rolling. So let me circle back around. So I think that it, it can certainly be good if you're doing it for the right reasons. Um, I don't think it should be used broadly across the board for everybody. I think if you feel like you've got a tight muscle or you're trying to get rid of DOMS, um, spending 30 seconds to two minutes on a specific muscle can be beneficial if you slow down and you actually hit the spots that need to be released. Um, I think if people, what, one of the problems I see is people trying to deactivate muscles that are actually too loose and that facilitates the problem. You know, if your rhomboid is too weak to hold your shoulder blade back, but it aches because it's weak, it aches because it's weak, not because it's tight. So what do you do? You go to the massage, you go get a lacrosse ball and you start to beat that muscle up and neurologically turn it off again. Well, now guess what? Now that muscle is even weaker. And so then you're, you're predisposed to ribs moving, and then you're also going to refacilitate the imbalance of the antagonist system. So now your pecs are even stronger relatively to your rhomboids than they were before. Right. So talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, we're acknowledging that, you know, rolling and, and um, you know, shoving a tennis ball or whatever in there is is definitely down-regulating the, the muscle's ability to contract, right? It's actually, it's turning down the nerve system's uh, signal sure. in there. Talk about, you know, if, if we're an athlete trying to, uh, you know, pre-workout, trying to maximize force production. Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, is, is that where we want to go? Like, yeah, hey, I want to I want to turn off my lat a little bit so I can get my hand above my head to, to really get my delt fully shortened above my head. Um, but is that going to be compromising my integrity of my shoulder joint? Yeah, and it depends on the person. It depends on what you have going on. Um, and you can do too much too. Like, so, so if you're already tight and you hammer this thing a whole bunch, yeah, we destabilize the muscle. So it depends on your goal, I think, um, depending on what you're doing. Um, we run into this with fighters, for example. I actually prefer them not to do rolling or, or any soft tissue work really the week of the fight. And the main purpose is because this is such a game of inches that any, any confusion to their brain, because their brain has a perception of where they've been. So one of, the, one of the issues that we run into when we do soft tissue work is jumping right back in the gym when you've had a whole bunch of soft tissue work and then trying to do the weight because your brain expects it to be tight. And if you can't communicate with your body effectively, you're much more likely to injure yourself or in fighting, get knocked out because your punch doesn't move. It maybe goes too far um, compared to where you've been training it for eight to 10 weeks. 
Um, so we actually try to keep them off of that unless we absolutely have to, right? So unless they're in completely limited range of motion, whether it's due to a spasm because of, you know, contractions that they developed during weight cut um, or whatever else. And I've run into the same problem too with bodybuilders with doing too much scraping and things like that on themselves. So there's a, there's a big group of people out there that don't think that there's any kind of physical change that happens from deep tissue work. Um, there's not a lot of research to either support or disprove that. But again, based on anecdote and logic, um, I've seen people that have completely ruptured muscles because they've done too much scraping. Um, there, there's certainly a change that can happen there, particularly if you're not using anabolic substances because you don't recover as well. And if you're loading those muscles completely, it can certainly be a problem where they've, they've been doing gua sha or grass then on their tricep tendon every single day. And then what happens is they rupture their tricep. Um, because there is a, a physiological change happening there. And, and for people that don't think that is, again, I would like to know the magic of how we break ribs when we do CPR. Right. Now, it takes a certain amount of force. And again, we're talking, you know, pounds per square inch or pounds per square millimeter because people will say, you know, you can't deform the IT band. Well, it depends on the amount of force and the size because I'm pretty sure I could take a needle and stick it in your IT band and that's deformed. Now, if I put a medicine ball there, it's probably not going to deform it. So it, it always depends on, you know, the viscosity of the tissue, the, the depth of it, and how much, you know, pounds per square inch or pounds per square millimeter or even smaller that we're doing. Man, that's such a beautiful articulation of, um, you know, why, you know, foam rolling could be could be important or soft tissue work could be important. But that, you know, a week leading up to a fight for a fighter, um, their brain knows where they've been. And trying to, to fool that is just predisposing you to injury. And I think people need to acknowledge that point. So I wanted to bring it back around because uh, it's, that's so important. Right. And I think that's awesome. And e even, you know, conversely, the opposite side of that, maybe you're someone who's doing soft tissue work every week. And then maybe that becomes part of, you know, it's be your brain's learned how to adapt and that's actually become part sure. of your movement cycle, which is again, another beautiful acknowledgement, but just, you know, the beauty of what you're saying there is there's a thought process, man. And I think uh, it's so nice to have um, people at your level who uh, just have a complete thought process. And that was one of the, the, you know, things that got me excited about getting you on is you have these people who think, um, you know, they see the trees and they don't see the forest, right? They, they have one as it's like people who think that the gut is the, you know, the, the end all and be all for nutrition or, or health. And then, then people that think right. the hormone manipulation is the end all be all, but then you have a guy like yourself who's coming in and putting all these pieces together. Uh, that's man, that's awesome. So, um, a lot of our demographic has a very specific objective, right? We're wanting to build muscle. We're wanting to obviously get leaner. We're going to get strong. So what are some of the key components to, um, you know, first balancing a body toward leading toward um, allowing you to, to accumulate strength and hypertrophy? So, you know, you look at a pelvis and someone's got really, you know, 90% of the people say, we're going to say, I have really tight hamstrings. What are some of the mitigation strategies you implement to start uh, overcoming these things? Yeah. So there's a couple components to that. So one, histologically, hamstrings are just wider tight, like we talked about with flexors before. Generally speaking, when we're looking at like tendon ruptures or muscle ruptures, they're, they're mostly going to be flexors. You're going to see Achilles tendon ruptures and hamstring tears and pec tears and bicep ruptures. And part of that, again, as we talked about histologically speaking, they're wired to be tighter. And neurologically, they're wired to be tighter. Also, their, their attachment points tend to be more narrow, too. If you think about the broadness of a, an extensor tendon, usually we have multiple heads that are tying in, say the triceps, for example. Uh, the quadriceps, for example, we have multiple heads attaching. So there's a, an ability to distribute force a little bit differently. Um, you know, hamstrings and biceps and pecs, they all have very narrow attachment points. And there's a vast majority of force um, that goes into there. And if you look at the bodybuilding world, and I don't know if you've torn muscles yourself, I've torn both hamstrings, my pec major, um, you know, <laughs> no, things, I've never things torn pop anything, and tear. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> well, you never know. I mean, I've known a few guys that actually were able to get through most of their career, just whether by free chance or genetics or, you know, I've got both calves have been torn and my left hamstring has been torn twice, yeah. but that's and actually both my triceps were torn, but it wasn't a, Not a full rupture. it was more of a, a repetitive. Yeah, yeah. It was a very strange tear. It was repetitive strain that ended up fraying the ends of my tendon. They were still attached, but they were fraying. Mm, and that's super common in bodybuilders. Um, Oh, dude, it was terrible. Yeah. It's just stupid training for too many, long, too many years. Yeah. And, and that's, that's an area where, I, in my opinion, you know, doing some deep tissue work on the belly of the tricep can help to take some of the, the tension off the end. You know, working through some concentric exercise or, excuse me, eccentric exercise can help with that somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just kind of the consequence of heavy triceps. And I had stem and, cells and PRP yeah. and, and literally within yeah. eight weeks, I was, I was 100% healed. And that would be a good indication of why you would do that. And sometimes what I get into is people, again, they're like, should I get PRP for this or, or, or whatever for this? And I'm like, well, you have to understand the mechanism of why you're going to do this. 
For example, if I have a fighter with a torn MCL and they don't want to do surgery, well, I'm not really going to do PRP in this case. What I want is inflammation to tighten the ligament up. So that patient would do prolotherapy. If somebody has a muscular tendinous issue like the Achilles tendonitis fraying issue or a tricepin, that's where PRP or stem cell is going to do better. Um, so again, applying the right therapy in the right patient population is crucial. Um, so, so again, talking about like the tight hamstring issues, one thing that I will certainly challenge people on that too, if you think you have tight hamstrings for one, just see if you can loosen up that QF and see if that, what that does for you. Um, but what you're going to look at is you're going to look at. So can you, can you run me back again and tell me what, how we loosen up the QF? I, I know you men, mentioned the quadratus from Morris, but uh, mm-hmm. I forget what you said to actually was. The... So, so here's how I like to get to it. I like to put a lacrosse ball on the end of a workout bench. And, and okay. like I said, it's between the ischial tuberosity and the greater trochanter, super spicy yep. area. So what, what I do is if I'm going to roll my, if I'm going to hold, I'm not going to roll it. I'm just going to hold it. So if I'm going to do my right side, what I do is I put it there and I tilt my body weight to the right. I cross my right leg over my left one. And then I'll find that little sore spot right there. And all I'm going to do is hold it until it fades away. <laughs> Sounds terrible, man. I'm going to stop you right there. It's, so, yeah. So, basically, it's like right where the, the femur meets the acetabulum. Yep. And Just so a what little that bit does, meat. Yeah. And so, that holds the femur in external rotation. So, that can create a whole number of issues if you're trying to squat, if you're trying to get glute max engagement, or, or you're trying to get hamstring flexibility. Because you'll think you'll stretch your hamstring, you'll stretch your hamstring, you'll roll your hamstring. Well, here's the thing. If you're stretching it and rolling it and stretching it and rolling it and it's not getting looser, it's probably not your hamstring. So, that's interesting. Can, okay. and, so- and, and, and think about that when you guys are doing anything. If you're doing something for something and it's not working, it's probably not the intervention. You're probably doing the wrong thing. Gotcha. So now just looking at function, the quadratus femoris is an external rotator of the, of the femur. So yep. ultimately we need to be in internal rotation to in an attempt to uh, lengthen it? Well, it depends what you're trying to do. If you're already externally rotated, your external rotators aren't going to get good activation. So if you're trying to get glute max activation, but you're already preloaded in that position, you can't elongate the muscle to get a full range of motion on it. Mm-hmm. Um, also, so it's to lengthen the quadratus femoris, we want to internally rotate? You can try. It's very difficult to stretch. So okay. that's why I like to do self-myofascial on that particular one. Gotcha. You can try. Like I said, it's it's very difficult to move that into internal rotation because you're, you've got so many other muscles across the joint, the TFL, yeah. uh, the sartorius. There's a whole bunch of other ones that get in the way there. But that's one that I found with a lot of my power lifters and bodybuilders. Just just mixing that one in has made their deadlifts and squats significantly better because they can pinch and, and they, can, they can pivot their hips so the femur can drop down out of the way. And then they get full activation. They, they have better leverage from that position because they can get their ass down. Yeah. Um, um, do you ever do any um, – so one of the things that worked really well for me, and, and it seems like it actually maybe as, as a result of activating this muscle, was I would just do um, like pretty intense, you know, 10 out of 10 perceived exertion uh, adductor activations. So like, um, you know, basically squeezing my knees together all the way up to my pubic bone, trying to squeeze as aggressively mm-hmm. as I can. So it's almost like you're, you're creating a little bit of extra rotation with, with that activation, but it feels like or it seems as though it would probably be activating the quadratus femoris. And so the reason I bring that up is I felt like that actually increased my internal rotation, increased my ability to get deeper into a squat. Oh, yeah. I can see that from a muscle activation technique. I could could certainly see that. Um, So, yeah, you know, and everybody's a little different, right? So you kind of have to combine what works for you. If it doesn't seem to do that well for you, it makes you feel weaker, you probably shouldn't do it, right? So same thing goes with like loosening up the adductors. So one of the things I'll have people do, like if they're going to do a glute day, for example, is just do a little bit of soft tissue work on their adductors first because, again, you're you're not going to be able to to abduct as well if your adductor is tight. Um, but what I wouldn't do is a ton of work on something that you're going to work because you don't want that muscle either slightly damaged or pre fatigued because you're going to susce- I mean, you're going to make yourself susceptible uh, potentially to a muscle injury or something right. like that. Um, but yeah, going back to the research, like one of the things that that you know I was talking about. So so chiropractic manipulation would be a good example. So understanding what exactly we're trying to do is very important. So if I'm doing a study on lower back pain, generalized lower back pain, for example, and then I end up at about 50% or close to placebo. Um, one of the issues that we're talking about here is we're not really understanding what manipulation does. So if I have a ligamentous injury or a discus or your, you know, uh, your fascia is causing pain or you have a muscular imbalance, there's no biological premise that would seem to make sense why manipulation or gapping of joints would benefit that. However, if you have a sacroiliac joint dysfunction, if the patient presents with pain about an inch away from the spine that seems to be facet joint oriented, and they got manipulation, I would actually expect that result to be more over 75%. So 
you know, one of the problems that chiropractors and massage therapists or physical therapists have is that they view the world through their lens or even surgeons, right? So everybody that goes into a massage therapist, what are they going to say? You're really tight here. You've got trigger points. The chiropractors tell you your bones are out of place. The physical therapist tells you you've got a weak core. <laughs> the surgeon says, well, we've got an orthopedic consequence. And they all have an intervention that's specifically tailor-made to you. And sometimes it, it's going to be an expensive intervention or it might take three months. And they know exactly how many visits it's going to take, which is, of course, intellectually dishonest because we haven't actually experimented on you yet. So if everybody that came into my office got manipulation, I would guess, and this, there's not any research on this, that maybe 15 to 20% would do better. The ones that do better are going to be very adamant about it and say that this is the greatest thing ever, and they'll walk around, and thus we'll have the anecdote, which is why these professions still exist, whether it's acupuncture, chiropractic, and those things are not new. They've been around for thousands of years. The problem is we haven't had the physiological understanding of when and where yeah. to apply them. Now, the same thing could go if I went into my doctor's office and he gave every single patient diabetes medication, you, everybody got metformin. Well, you know, 10 to 12 percent of Americans have type 2 diabetes. So those 10 to 12 percent are going to do better and get healthier. But everybody else is either going to be the same or worse. And that's one of the issues when you everybody goes to get a massage or everybody goes to PT or Cairo is that by the nature of the intervention itself, because they're not viewing things, um, whether it's because of financial incentive or their education or whatever else, that these types of presentations might not be benefit, you know, might not be benefit to have this intervention. And in fact, it could be deleterious and oftentimes is when applied improperly. Man, I'm sending you a big hug right now through the, through the air because I <laughs> I feel everyone needs to hear this conversation, man. Because uh, and, and <laughs> honestly, it's awesome. Um, and this is exactly what you try to tell people is you know the square peg round hole scenario where um, everyone's doing everyone thinks that um, their modality is the solution. Everyone thinks that their modality is the, is the end all and be all. And everyone needs a chiropractor. Everyone needs a physical therapist. And the reality is, who effing knows until you actually know exactly what's going on. So that being said, walking right. down that path, how do people begin to know? Is it is it a matter of having to go to someone as intelligent as yourself and as experienced as yourself to actually start to figure out what modality is going to work for me without having to spend thousands of dollars? Yeah, that's tough, isn't it? That's a, that's a tough thing right now, especially in the era of the internet expert, right? Like, you know, one of the bastardizations that's happened with science is that there's an incentivization. There, people um, are incentivized to sell books and to take a side, like having a moderate opinion or saying it depends doesn't sell Dude, that's very much well. That's my life. Uh, the same thing that's happens. where I live. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, whether it's the media or whatever else, whether they're reporting on the president or school shootings or whatever, saying, hey, listen, this is a nuanced conversation. We need to have some discussion about, you know, sometimes this happens. Oh, no, no, no. That doesn't get clicks. So if I'm a PhD, for example, and I take a stance on something and I, I have a book to sell, um, a scientist would acknowledge if that ends up being wrong later on, but it, it, it takes away from your professional expertise to retract. So as a human being, do you really think they're going to do that? Because why would somebody buy their new book when it, their new book is saying their old right. book is wrong? Well, I, I might and you might, but most people won't. I would actually trust that person more because they were honest about their own shortcomings. So it's very difficult for an average person to be able to navigate this kind of a market. And the internet is a, in fact, I was having, a funny place, right? The internet, internet's a funny place because if you change your stance on something, you've got 8 million trolls calling you a liar <laughs> when you're just trying to be honest, right? You're like, well, I, I've discovered right. something and then oh, well, you said this before. You're a terrible person. And you're like, oh, okay, I can't win right. this battle. So they could. Yeah, and a beautiful theory does that a fact make, and research is always changing, and it should. You know, anybody that says the science is settled doesn't understand the basic tenets of science. It's it's always asking questions, not trying to prove something. You can only disprove something. It's the null hypothesis. Um, so how do we? Okay, so how do we know where to go without actually talking to somebody who's an expert? I, I don't know. You know, one of the issues that I'm always trying to work with with clinicians is is again, let's logic our way through these things. If this, then this. If this, then this. You know, a good example of this that I was discussing with my class the other day is is when we look at structuralism, right? Like we're beginning to understand that structure is not a, will always equal function. It does sometimes, but not always. When we look at MRI reports on people with certain types of back pain, knee pain, or whatever else, well, New England Journal of Medicine says about 82% of people that have never had back pain have disc bulges. Okay, so then that means a lot of people that have disc bulges don't have back pain, right? Okay, does that mean that all people with disc bulges? No, we, I mean, these are Venn diagrams. So Arthroscopic surgery for meniscus tears or arthritis. There's been several studies over the last few years to basically indicate that those are no better than placebo. And here's the flaw with that. Okay, so now we don't. So, so the the reaction, the gut response is to say arthroscopic surgery doesn't work. Well, no, that means it's being applied improperly sometimes. So if we take a person, we do a bunch of MRIs, and they they have a meniscus tear, but their symptoms. That this is what we call triangulation. Their symptoms don't make sense, right? They've got a meniscus tear, but their pain is around their kneecap. 
They didn't twist their leg. There was no pop. Their orthopedic tests are negative. We could probably say with a certain amount of certainty that that meniscus tear might be silent. That's not why their knee is hurting. So if I did surgery to repair that meniscus, we could expect the outcome to not be that great. However, if we narrowed that study down and we said, listen, we're only going to do surgery on people that recently had a trauma. They twisted their knee. There was a pop. Uh, they can't straighten it. Their joint is locked. They have a positive orthopedic test. And then we did the procedure. I think the outcomes would be significantly better. So unfortunately, we're just saying knee pain generally, but we're not specifying the type of knee pain. Same thing with back pain. Like, um, you know, unless we specify and we get specific with these studies, does manipulation work for back pain? Well, some of it. But why would it work for a disc herniation? The mechanism doesn't even make sense. Um, you know, and I think that's the case for a lot of interventions. So what they want to do is throw that out, you know, and we have to look at risk benefit too. So people, you know, there's a bunch of people online, they're like, you know, don't do acupuncture, blah, 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 blah. And, and my argument to that would say, Hey, listen, is it going to work in a lot of people? Probably not. You know, 15, 20% of people do well with it. Is that enough to make that the first line therapy? I wouldn't do that as my first line therapy. I would do something else that was more statistically viable. However, if you're not in that first demographic, like I said, that 70%, we don't ignore the people in the 30% on both ends. We don't say they can't have that. And what we want to do is we want to do something with a low risk and potentially low reward, but we want to do a low risk. So if you have a bad acupuncture session, generally speaking, you're just going to waste 60 bucks. If you have a bad surgery, you know, you could be crippled for life. The, the, the relative risk is so much higher there. Thus, the importance of doing conservative therapy first. But the point is, is that we don't want to always throw out interventions just because we are at an abstract somewhere. Um, what we want to do is get some triangulation. And I think we could get clinicians to start to analyze those things and acknowledge those things that they could be more honest and be better clinicians with their patients. How does that translate to helping people find those clinicians? You know, I, I wish I had an answer. If it was a simple answer, I, I think mean, it would be the, fixed, the, right? You know, if there's a simple answer to gun control, well, the, answer, it would the, already be the fixed, reality is know? no clinician is going to send somebody away and say, hey, man, I don't want your money. I can't help you. Like they're going to say, yes, of course I can I have the solution, right? And, and unfortunately, there's not enough people who have – and not to throw anybody under the bus, but – um, you know, there's a lot sure. of competition in that space, in the rehab space. You know, like, is physical therapy the solution to your problem? Of course it is the solution. If that's what the office you happen to walk into that day, <laughs> uh, you know, and that's that's just the reality. Unfortunately, until we, we have people like yourself who um, maybe, you know, put together the mission of creating some type of resource for people to go, hey, if here's your, if this is your symptom, try this therapy first, yeah. you know, like. And that's a good idea. Maybe we could come up with like an algorithm for patients. Well, man, if you have, honestly, you know? I'm sure you um, see hundreds, if not thousands, of patients. Like, just create a, create a, 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 a checklist that says, "Hey, here's here's what my symptoms were. Here's what my my treatment was." Eventually, you're going to have enough of a database that says, "Well, we could probably make some pretty good deductive um, conclusions from this." Sure, and we have that already. The question is, is how do we make that um, accessible to the regular person? And I, I think that's actually. You know, one of the things I get on my guys, too, is like as a clinician, you don't have a protocol. Protocols yes, are for lazy you. people that don't want to think and don't want to don't want to problem solve. That doesn't work. Everybody's unique and individual. Um, and, and there's so many variables that go into something. You should look at every one of these problems as a challenge and try to problem solve it that way. There's not a chart. Like when I see these, you know, clinicians pull out a chart and they're like, OK, if this, then this. No, 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 no. Throw them in the trash. OK. All right. But as a, as a patient, I think that might actually be something that would be beneficial. You know, if you've got pain over this many weeks, here are the options you would try now. If this fails, then move here. Maybe maybe that's a resource that we can uh, create. Man, for I people love that you brought point. that up, that you've you're trying to teach your, your um, therapist a thought process. So I'd say. <laughs> and this is what I teach my coaches, right? I'm like, hey, man, I'm not teaching you uh, exactly how to build a muscle. I'm not teaching you how to transform somebody's body. I'm teaching you a thought process to be able to come up with these conclusions yourself. So speaking that way, if you had a, um, you know, we have you know, a large demographic of people in, in listening to this who may be trainers, who may be uh, trying to transform their body. Um, can you start uh, at least some uh, offering as to what the thought process may be, how you would approach uh, an injury. So is it, you know, is it walking from some type of structural assessment to some type of um, stability assessment? Like, I don't want to words in your mouth, but um, can you walk us down the sure. path of what that thought process may look like? Yeah. And I guess what would have to happen to begin with is that the, the patient or the client would have to have some input in knowing how they got hurt. And that's not always the case. I, you know, I'm assuming. So if, if it's an acute injury and they can actually, connect the dots on when it happened, that's a lot easier to work with um, because you kind of know what the offending exercise was. And, and, and 
So I'm a good example of this. Like I'm somebody that I still work out, but you know, I've seen enough bodybuilders and, and powerlifters have to have hip and shoulder replacements and stuff in the late forties and fifties. I've really kind of backed off on the heavy stuff. So I haven't deadlifted in almost 10 years. Part of that is just me. I've got what's called um, Sherman's disease. So the curvature of my spine isn't very productive for doing deadlifts. So any kind of loading in that position, I get these, what are called schmorls nodes. I get vertical disc herniations that go up into the bone. So I got to the point and I, you know, I used to do some physique shows and things like that too, um, where I would throw my back out doing RDLs with like 25 pounds. So after, you know, if it happens one time, two times, it could be chance, but if something happens consistently, you may need to make a change yeah. from that. So that's something that I would, I would tell, you know, trainers as well. Not, not every exercise is for everybody, you know, like if you weigh a certain amount, maybe plyometrics aren't for you, you know, uh, you know, squats aren't for everybody. Deadlifts aren't for everybody. So the goal, generally speaking of a client, of a personal trainer or whatever, is going to be to look good naked generally and be healthy generally. Those are the biggies. Some of you might be power lifters or whatever else, but for most people, the goal is to, to, to be sexy, right? So like, how do we accomplish that without getting hurt? Because when you throw your back out and you're out of the gym for three weeks, all of the gains that you would have made are gone because you were injured. So, you know, assess what works for you and what doesn't to be honest about it yourself. Just because you want to bench, you know, how did I tear my pec? Well, trying to bench 480 pounds. Um, so guess what? I can't do flat bench anymore because I didn't have surgery. So, Or maybe it's just uh, doing it incorrectly. I mean, as you know more than anybody, it, sure. it's oftentimes injuries aren't caused from the exercise itself. The, you know, exercise isn't the problem. It's the way you're doing it. Right. Or it's both, right? It's that or it could be your mechanics, right? right. So you may have to deadlift off of a um, – right. Maybe you just don't fit in the exercise, right? Right. And like, yeah. like a, like a, uh, what do they call it? A, a leg press machine. Like I tell people, I said, Hey man, that thing's designed for somebody who's about, you know, five, nine to five, 11. If you're yep. six, five, you don't really fit in that loaded leg press machine. So, right. Or you need to find the range of motion that you can use it for and then throw the rest out. Right. And, and some people just don't fit no matter what they do. Like, because right. it, because it doesn't get the angle of the muscle that you would want to work anyway. So you modify it. Um, same thing with a squat bar. If you can't get your shoulder back, well, there's a lot of different apparatuses that you can put on your back or your front um, to be able to work through that range. So you have to be able to assess what the productivity is of that patient or client and what their goals are. So, you know, like me, for example, I don't need to bench or squat, but if somebody's a power lifter, that's what they do. So we need to try to figure out a way to make them do that. And whether that's working them into that range, you know, from a, a perspective of, of changing the depth slowly over time until they're comfortable in that, so progressive tissue loading, um, or it's changing the length tension relationships, such as calves are tied if you have poor ankle mobility um those are kind of things that i would look at as as a trainer to try to help to assess those people but you know for starters you know pain-free full range of motion is a good place to begin as a trainer if, if somebody can't do that then they're gonna have a hard time working through your program yeah absolutely man um so you've got some athletes coming up into the ufc man tell me about what some of the common um, ailments, if there is such a thing, common ailments you see in uh, high level fighters. Yeah, you see, I mean, what you'd expect, I think, from grappling, I mean, everybody has neck pain, right? So I've, I've really never met anybody in my life that's never had neck pain. So that's part of the human condition, particularly as we use our iPads and phones and things like that. But at grappling, people are yanking on it all the time. Um, yeah. So, you know, we've been blessed. I actually treat it, if you guys know anything about MMA, I, I work out of Jackson Link MMA. You know, I've been blessed enough to work with fighters from other camps as well. So I think over the last 10 years, I've been able to work with 10 UFC world champions. Um, and we've had, I think two injury plots for, at least for Jackson wing fighters and over three years based on injuries. And, you know, a couple of those, one was a broken rib, one was a broken hand. Um, and then one was the Conor McGregor throwing the bus that got in Ray Borg's eye. So not a lot I can do. It's not really my scope. Um, but what we try to do is what we try to do is we get, um, we're the first contact. So I'm the director of sports medicine. So what they do is they come in, I assess them. I tell them if they think they need to go to the orthopedic surgeon. Unfortunately, again, we talk about lenses a lot of these other camps, I think, if they go to a doctor that doesn't really understand fighting that much or they don't understand soft tissue, they go to an orthopod, they do an MRI, we see a silent tear of the rotator cuff, which again, you're going to see in almost every single baseball player, bodybuilder, you know, you're going to see those structural abnormalities. James Andrews did a study where 91% of baseball players in his study had labral or rotator cuff abnormalities, none of which had ever had shoulder pain. So when they have shoulder pain and we do an MRI, was it there before? Well, we don't know. So we're able to get that first point of contact and I can kind of assess and see, you know, uh, do I think this is a broken bone? Um, you know, is there instability here? Is this something that can keep you out of the fight or do we keep you there? Because guess what? They don't get paid if they don't fight. Um, we also don't want them to go in there at a, at a percentage for risking injury where they, you know, get a massive concussion because they were babying an injury too. So it's a very uh, tight path that we've got to walk with that. 
But some of the injuries that we see, we see obviously tons of shoulder injuries. You know, the repetitive motion of punching, swinging, you know, it's very similar to, to bodybuilding in a way where we're getting that repetitive motion involving the pecs and the delts and the lats. Um, so unfortunately, again, if they have shoulder pain, they run in there, get an MRI, they go, oh, look, you've got a torn rotator cuff. It's, you know, partially torn rotator. We're going to do surgery and knock you out for nine months. Well, some of these guys' careers aren't really that long and they can't afford to be out of work that long. So we get them pieced up. We decide if it's actually clinically relevant or not, meaning we have stability of the humerus, or is it just a silent issue that as long as we get the, the humerus rotating correctly, uh, we get the muscles stop yanking on the, on the joints that we can get them back into fighting. Um, the muscle, you know, the injuries we can't fix, obviously, uh, broken hands, you know, cracked feet, and, and those are what they are. They, they just kind of are what they are. But luckily, we've been able to make sure that we've never had a fighter pull out with back pain. We've never had a fighter pull out with shoulder pain, knee pain, uh, not, not knee pain. I take that one back. We had a, a torn ACL last year um, or neck pain. So if we can get them um, warming up properly and then training smart, too, is a, is a big issue. Um, but, yeah, MMA has been a really cool thing for me. It's been able to really um, – MMA has actually broadened me out into bodybuilding and powerlifting and, you know, being able to work with, uh, you know, big Ray Williams and Ed Cohn and uh, Dr. Deadlift and some of these other guys um, that are just looking for somebody to kind of analyze their biomechanics and see if there's any tweaks that we can kind of make to them to help them be healthier and stronger. Awesome, man. Um, what, what level of strength training and hypertrophy training are your athletes doing? Is that a part of their, cause you know, you see, you look at a lot of fighters and a lot of them are very anterior, look, look, mm -hmm. they're very tight through the pack. Obviously that's, that's a part of, you know, the sport being, being having to, having to be, you know, in that, that ready position all the time. Um, are you incorporating, um, you know, strength training and, um, hypertrophy style training into their regimes obviously maybe not in, in the fight prep time but maybe yeah it depends on the fighter so everybody's a little different and most of them work more specifically with their own strength coaches who we talk to and we just give them kind of some input say hey listen based on what we're seeing do you think you could work a little bit more on this or a little bit more on that um most of the trainers that work with them at this point are tend to do a little bit more um they do some strength and hypertrophy training but some of it can be deleterious depending on the fighter. So it depends on your style, your genetics. Sure. You know, some guys are fast twitch. So they're very dangerous in the first round and then their muscles kind of burn out. Um, some guys genetically, again, um, can go forever and they're actually more at risk of getting knocked out in the first round. So how do we how do we tinker with them to make them either faster or stronger but not take away from their other strengths? Um and to make sure they're on weight too. So some of our bigger guys do a lot more weight, you know, heavy weight lifting, like John Jones, for example, um, does a lot of deadlifting and, and pretty heavy squatting. Um, and he's kind of tinkering back and forth between heavy weight and, and light heavy weight. Um, generally speaking, for a lot of these guys, what we want them doing is more explosive movement and then a lot of stability works. So we want them working on the rotator cuffs. They're, uh, you know, we're doing traditional, the big three, we're doing stuff like, um, the explosive work is going to be more traditional Olympic lifting. So if you're trying to finish a takedown, what's a good lift for that? Well, a power clean would probably be a good lift for that. It's not something you're doing over and over again in repetition. Um, and we find that a lot of the conditioning is done just by nature of sparring and, and wrestling and those things on their own. Yeah. So my thing with, um, you know, my articulation of healthy athlete is someone who's very stable and you brought up that word stable. That's why I ask about, um, the relative incorporation of, of, uh, hypertrophy training and strength training, because, you know, these guys getting to those positions that maybe their joints are being compromised. It just makes sense in my mind that says, Hey man, if we can make them, um, stable in these places, the likelihood of getting into these compromised positions, or maybe importantly, more importantly, getting out of these compromised positions is, you know, with less injuries is hopefully greatly improved. So that's why I was very curious. Um, you know, I've got a couple UFC guys who train next door, um, to my place here in Florida and, uh, they, they do a fair bit, but I'm always very curious to see, um, you know, how much that's involved in, in the success of their training. Yeah, it's, it's almost tough to know, really, because the sport is so unique in a sense that it's almost like combining five sports in one, right? Like they're, they're yeah. training, they're, they're overtraining really most is. of them. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a problem. We try to taper it back, but especially in the area of, um, you know, no PEDs. I mean, there, there was a time where you could probably train four hours a day or four times a day and, and be okay. Um, but at this point, if you're, if you're doing grappling, you're doing striking, you're hitting mitts, now you're doing strength conditioning, and then you're running to cut weight too. Like it, yeah. this, this podcast will know more than other places, how, how deleterious that can be to, to your hormones, to your joints, to your ability to recover, or even to your nervous system. Right. I feel um, like that's the evolution of that sport is, you know, because PEDs are no longer a thing, the next evolution has to be in learning to balance those, um, interventions because, 
you're absolutely right, man. Like the amount of stuff they're doing is absolutely crazy. And and the amount of stuff they need to do, I mean, and ask an athlete to do less and he's going to say, he's going to say yep. crazy because ultimately it's, it's life or death, right? My life is on the line. There's no way. And I know this as an athlete, there's no way I'm going to under prepare. Yep. I would always, always, always err on the side of over preparation. And that's a very hard line so hard. to, to, yeah, man, because, you know, I, I want to make sure that I've done everything and then and then some and I'm going to do more than that other guy. And, and we have to teach these guys. It's not necessarily about more. It's about better. You know, the idea of perfect practice makes perfect. Right. And uh, I mean, I think there's still a lot of room for improvement in that sport with um, keeping these guys super healthy while still figuring out what the, you know, the biggest lever is to pull right yeah, now. I agree a thousand percent with you there. That's that's the big issue there. You know what I would like to see and we, we try to work with them. Some listen, some don't, you know, is. We want to make sure that your cardio is there to be able to go the whole fight because that's a damn shame if, if you've got everything else right and your cardio gives out on you. But, you know, I don't see enough um, film prep. I, I think film is a huge benefit to lifting, to fighting. You know, I played college football for five years. One of the most important aspects every single day, one to two hours of film, you're studying your opponent, you're studying yourself. It's hard to be objective with yourself without actually looking at the tape and finding tendencies, not only in yourself, but in your opponent, too. So if you can see right. that and you can see that you're, you're, you're not generating enough force at the back foot, you can, you can actually take a look at that and then start to implement things that can make that better, whether that's mobility work, strengthening work, whatever you've got to do, specific training, plyometrics, whatever that is to address an issue. Unfortunately, in a non-team environment, who is going to hold your, your foot to the fire and make you study film? Right. Well, that's, but the thing is from an athlete's perspective, they might not, I mean, I, I, I may be completely ignorant with this, but most athletes, myself included as a bodybuilder, sometimes you, you don't even have the skill set to know what to do. Like if you saw something wrong, you'd be like, oh, just, you know, that's why you're trusting your coaches and your team. You brought up the team. Uh, right. Mentality. Like, man, if you don't have a great coach and someone you absolutely trust, you're probably, um, fighting a hard battle, man. Cause looking at the tape yourself and going, Oh yeah, I see my weaknesses here. And then learning sure. what to do and how much to do them and how often to do them is, man, that's like, that's a huge skill set in itself, which is why I'm sure retired fighters be become the best coaches or make the best coaches. Because once you're removed from it, like myself from <laughs> bodybuilding, once I yeah. remove myself, I can objectively stand back and go, Oh, I see now. Whereas when you're in it, you're so in the day to day of, man, I have to I have to win today. Like I have to be a hundred percent on today. And I'm so focused thing, focused on my output, my production, my production today, uh, you know, stepping back and objectively assessing like, Oh, this, I'm doing this wrong. It's very hard, man. You're so focused on just go, 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 go. Uh, it's a, it's a tough place to be. Yeah. And, and that's interesting too. And I'm sure you wish you could go back and get, get, a, get in your younger self's ear now that you've been away from it a little bit and you've been coaching guys and, and knowing what works and what doesn't. You know, hindsight's always awesome, 20, 20 I wish I had a coach, right? I wish I had somebody who, who I could look at and go, oh, man. And I, and I did. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I had some brilliant people in, in my corner. But, you know, it would be so great to have that one person who, you know, knew all pieces of it. And when I started bodybuilding at 17 mm -hmm. or maybe 18, I looked and I was like, hey, man, who's the guy who knows training, who knows nutrition, who knows posing, who knows supplementation, all these different pieces? Uh, it didn't seem like there was. And, you know, now it seems like there may be more people Better. that are at least closer. Uh, but at the time, there was none. So, I, you know, that's why I went out and developed that skill set myself. I was like, all right, I have to understand all these pieces. Right. Um, so, so I can ultimately, it was the irony of it is when you finally start to understand it, it's time to, to make your exit, right? Yep. And one of the tricky things too is like, we, as humans, we like black and white. We like right or wrong. We want there to be definitive answers. And that's one of the issues, again, we're running into in the powerlifting community, in the bodybuilding community is there, there is some literature on a lot of this stuff right now, but it's very poor science. A lot of them are cohort studies. You know, you look at the, the, and that's why you see every two years, you know, caffeine is good for you. Caffeine is bad for you. I mean, a lot of these are survey cohort <laughs> studies and, and, right. and frankly, they're not controlling any variables. I mean, this is really not very good science, but the layperson will read an abstract and then be like, well, the literature says, the science says, well, kind of. I mean, case studies get published, uh, you know, and most people think that even at a 0 0.05 um, significance rate, you're going to see roughly 30 percent combination false positives and negatives. And then what about reproducibility? Every time they reproduce a study, which it's hard to get them published to, to reproduce something that's the same. What we're finding, they did a reproducibility project in 2015, is that like 20 or 30 percent of even the cancer studies that were considered groundbreaking were actually reproducible after the fact and had the same results. And that's that's unsettling to people who want there to be answers. One of the examples I was telling somebody the other day, and this was going around, did you guys do the Laurel uh, Yanny thing? No? no? You guys haven't heard it? No. Nope. got to pull it up for a second. So what's going on there is there's, there's a frequency, and I only hear Laurel. So apparently I only hear the lower portion of the frequency. 
but everybody's hearing the exact same sound, but because of our biology in this particular case, some people will hear one sound and some people will hear another sound. And we talk about the nature of reality, and this is why eyewitnesses are usually not very um, you, you know, helpful as far as court cases or things like that, because we, we physically see different things. I mean, we see different spectrums of, of color, like I'm a little bit colorblind, so my red is like somebody else's red orange. Um, so we want these definitive truths and they kind of exist, but they kind of don't. And everybody's reality is kind of their own reality. It's kind of subjective in that sense. So even just on the biological basis, I hear Laurel, everybody else in here hears Yanni. Who's right and who's wrong, right? I, I can't hear Yanni, like <laughs> right. no matter what I do. Um, so as much as we want there to be definitive answers, of course, there, there isn't yet. What we have to say is based on the knowledge that we have now, based on the best current available literature, we can surmise that something could be. We don't say this is or this isn't, this works or it doesn't. Um, and, and unfortunately, that's not a fun lesson or something that people want to hear. They want to hear that this works, this doesn't. Keto works for everybody or, or whatever. And, you know, the right. simple truth is that's, you know, what we have to work on right now is the basic understanding of physiology. So we kind of know how the, the endocrine system works. We know how the Krebs cycle works. We know the TCA cycle works. Do we know how they all work in conjunction with each other? Well, not really. We are not able to completely measure ghrelin and leptin and, you know, antidiuretic hormone and how your body is responding to all these different types of diets. So what we have to work on is anecdote. And so if it works for you for now, okay, that's cool. But you have to acknowledge when it stops working for you too. And that can be said with, you know, training, uh, setting up your training schedule, uh, nutrition or whatever else. And what you'll find too is over the course of your life, what has worked for you in the past doesn't work anymore because either your biology is different or your patterns have changed um, or you're just getting older and your hormones don't respond the same way. And those are tough lessons for people to learn. But the, the, the point is you have to be able to listen to your body and try to be try to listen to yourself and try to be subjective and objective both with yourself. Dr. Bo Hightower, truthfully grateful man. Like you are a brilliant human being and the uh, UFC is very, very lucky to have you. And hopefully I get a chance to work with you one day because um, you know, have a set of eyes like yours, uh, figure out all my uh, accumulated pathologies over the last 20 years <laughs> would be uh, a massive, massive benefit. Where can everybody find you? Hey, uh, you can find me on Instagram. It's dr. Period Bo Hightower. Same thing on YouTube. So I'm a YouTuber now, apparently. Who knew, right? I was just to laugh at people. <laughs> hey, but, man, you got 26,000 like, followers. I noticed that. That's pretty good, man. Man, <laughs> I'm like, I think I've had 14 million views in the last like three months. Wow, good for you. Um, man. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna pay my mortgage with YouTube. Who would have known? But yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. If you, if you look it up. You uh, quit your day job, man. <laughs> You know, seriously. Uh, yeah, Dr. Bo Hightower over there on YouTube. So so the ironic thing, and this is kind of sad too, but like, so, you know, like I said, I have chiropractic education. I probably manipulate maybe five to 10% of people. But do you think people really want to sit down and listen to uh, deep nuanced conversations about the future of healthcare or analyzing muscles? No, what do they want to watch? People get their bones cracked. I'm like, yep. I'm like the Dr. Pimple Popper of YouTube, man. So, <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, I guess if they're going to pay me for it, then we'll put them up there. Uh, it's awesome. But yeah, we're, one of the, we're one of the things I want to tell people is like, okay. hey, that's not necessarily reflective of our practice. So, All right. Awesome. Yeah, man. And I'm going to link to some of your videos in the show notes and we'll link to your Instagram as well. Dr. Hightower, I'm truthfully grateful, man. Thank you so much. Hey, I appreciate it, man. All right, man. Have an awesome day. Take care. Hey guys, and that's a wrap for the podcast with Dr. Bo Hightower. Hopefully you enjoyed our conversation. He's a super bright guy. I'm going to do my best to get out there and see him in Las Vegas. And if you get a chance, do the same. Reach out to him on social media. He's a huge influencer in the fight space and a really, really highly respected guy. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you did, share it with someone who maybe has an injury, maybe someone who you know who's fighting, who needs to learn how to balance all those different training modalities. Have an amazing day. Live your greatest life in your greatest body.